Well, welcome everybody. You are tuning in to New Life Community Wesleyan Church, and I'm Pastor Scott. I'm glad that you've taken the time to join us today. We've got a great worship service that's planned. Uh, just for your information, we're recording this on Thursday, January 28th. Um, some conflicting problems. We usually record on Saturday, but because of some conflicts, uh, we're doing it on Thursday this week. And so it'll be posted on Sunday, January 31st. So uh, just wanted to make you aware of that if anything changes between now and then. Um, we do have a prayer meeting coming up this Wednesday at 7 p.m. and that will be available on Zoom. And uh, if you've not been getting the invitations and you'd like to be invited, just let me know and uh, I will make sure that you're included in that. Also wanted to let you know is next Sunday will be our leadership meeting. Next Sunday at 1 p.m. we'll be doing that via Zoom. And uh, that's something that we reg regularly schedule on the first Sunday of every month. So. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the, upper, of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will, never, he will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and right uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to worship you. And Lord, while we're not able to be together in person, we thank you that we can be gathered uh, over the computer or the television or however people are participating in this. And uh, Lord, we invite you into our homes, wherever we are, to uh, guide us and to direct us in our thinking and in our worship. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, be glorified through all that we do during this time together. We dedicate this time to you now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we'll turn it over to Wade and Josh to uh, lead us in our song time. morning. I hope you came to be cheered up and filled with joy today. These are like what I call happy songs, and I hope you can find the joy of the Lord in them today. Our first song, Victory in Jesus.
heart pumping and getting you wide awake. And get ready for our next song. It's called Trading My Sorrows. <clears throat> Jesus came. 
That's a great reminder for us, especially today. The uh, passage that we're looking at in Hebrews is going to talk about uh, some of the actions that we can take to secure, uh, make sure that we're living the right kind of life. And, uh, you know, we're reminded in that chorus of how God is holy, but it's also important for us to remember that we need to live holy lives as well. Thanks, guys, for helping out today. <clears throat> as far as prayer time, uh, just a couple of prayer requests that I jotted down from a uh, prayer meeting. Uh, first of all, my mom is moving. She needs to be out of her house this weekend, so uh, we're helping her with some of that. And uh, it's good news because she'll be getting her new house soon, but it's bad news because it's a little bit quicker than what we'd anticipated. Also, Sherry's grandson, Caleb, is going through some difficulties, and so we want to pray for Caleb. Also, uh, Kathy Wittes, our friend from California, she's been having problems with headaches. And uh, if I understood right, she said that uh, they had been uh, kind of remotely exposed to COVID. I feel like you got to <coughs> sneeze. Sorry about that. And then uh, Jose and Kathy have been having quite a few health problems, and we want to pray for them as well. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your presence with us today. and Thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given us to worship you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the songs that we've been able to sing. And Lord, just for, for the spirit of this uh, worship time, to be able to get excited about our salvation and our Savior and our God. Lord, just for the many ways in which you provide for us. And we want to say thank you. Thank you so much for how you provide for us and how you take care of us. We want to pray today, Lord, for our church, and we ask that you would continue to bless our church. We pray that you would enlarge its territory, that your powerful hand would guide it, and that you'd protect it from evil. And I pray especially as we look at next Sunday's uh, leadership meeting that you would give us uh, insight into things that we can be doing to be ministering to the people within our congregation and to be ministering to the people in our community. And I would pray, Lord, for your blessing and for your guidance in that. Give us extra discernment, and I pray, Lord, that we would hear from you. We want to pray also, Lord, for the uh, our nation and for our leaders. We ask, Lord, that you would guide them in the work that they're doing. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would be with all of those who are in authority over us. I pray, Lord, that we would have godly leaders who have a love for you and a fear of you, and I pray, Lord, that they would guide us in a path that would bring glory and honor to you. And uh, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I would ask that you would do this and that you would bring it into being. We want to pray also, Lord, for the people around us that protect us. We think of our uh, first responders, our military personnel. We pray for our health care workers, and we would ask, Lord, that you would bless each one of them and provide for them. I pray that you would be with them physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Grant them special protection. We want to pray also, Lord, for um, the requests that we thought of, we think of, uh, that were brought to us. I pray for my mom, and I pray that this move would go smoothly, and we pray, Lord, that her transition from this house to her new house would, would go well. And I just pray, Lord, for safety and uh, just emotional strength as well. We want to pray also, Lord, for uh, Jose and Kathy and for the physical problems that they've been struggling with. I pray, Lord, for your touch and for your healing in their bodies. We pray for uh, Caleb, and I pray, Lord, for your help and for your guidance for him. I pray, Lord, that you would touch him and heal him from the things that he's struggling with. We pray also for Kathy, and we ask, Lord, that you would... Uh, provide for her and care for her uh, with the headaches that she's struggling with. And Lord, we pray that you would protect her and Aurora from coronavirus, uh, but especially right now, we pray that you would bring healing from these headaches. Thank you, Lord, for your presence with us today and for the opportunity to worship you. Now, Lord, as we explore your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would illuminate your word to us, that you would help us to grow in our knowledge and understanding of you, but also we give you permission to shape us into the people that you want us to be. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So we're continuing on with our series in the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 4 today. I'm going to read the first 10 verses in a few minutes. And I'd really encourage you to take out your Bibles, maybe get a piece of paper to take down some notes as we're going through this. And, um, you know, as when we're gathered together as a group, I try to challenge you at the end of the messages to write down some action step, something you're going to do as a result of the message that you've heard today. And so maybe on your notes, you could uh, include that. While I'm thinking of it also, just a reminder that we are continuing to receive tithes and offerings. Um, you can drop those off at the church. You can do that through um, our church website. And uh, you can also uh, mail uh, support in. So, uh, so today's message is receiving God's rest. And I just encourage you as we go through this to look at how many times the author uses the word rest. And uh, as we think about that rest, I think we probably all agree that this has been a tiring year. It's been physically tiring uh, with all of the changes that we've gone through, but it's also been emotionally tiring and, and maybe a little bit spiritually tiring from time to time as well. And so as we, we think about uh, these challenges that we've gone through, I mean, we can go back and we can look at uh, seeing COVID-19 come into our country and dramatically change the way that we do things. We've seen uh, you know, race, racial tensions that have uh, really been dramatic this year. And then we've also just been through a, a, a rather contentious election. And all of these things are things that have uh, caused, for me anyway, They've caused us to be maybe a little bit more tired than usual. Maybe it's physically tired. Maybe it's emotionally tired. Maybe it's spiritually tired. But uh, like I said, many places in this passage that we're going to read, the author talks about rest. And I would just encourage you even maybe as you're going through in your Bible, if you're a person that underlines every time he uses that word rest, to, to underline that word rest in your Bible. And... Uh, as he uses that, I think that there's a couple of different contexts in which he uses it. He's talking maybe a little bit about the physical rest, but I think a lot of it points towards the eternal rest uh, that we have when we leave this life. And uh, hopefully we're all believers in Jesus Christ and we can uh, experience that. But one of the things that I notice in Scripture, in a lot of places, is the authors give us uh, ways to organize our lives so that we can experience different things. If you're familiar with me, you know that uh, one of my favorite passages of Scripture is in Philippians, where uh, Paul is talking about the peace that passes all understanding. And in the verses prior to that, he talk, tells us how we need to have that peace, kind of organizing our life to prepare for the peace that God has for us. And in this passage, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing that the author is telling us things that we can be doing to organize our life so that uh, we can have rest. And so these are going to be three actions that he gives us in order to experience rest in our lives. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do not enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my oath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some of us must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter, because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then they would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for all people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the example of disobedience. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. So 
So I went one over. You got a bonus first today, but I'm going to use that just a little bit. So the first action that he gives us in this passage is that we need to fear the Lord. Action number one is to fear the Lord. And just to give you a bit of review, last week we talked a little bit about this. Uh, the Israelites, when Moses was leading them, he led them out of Egypt, out of a life of slavery, performed all of those uh, famine, or not famines, but uh, plagues that were able to lead up to them leaving Egypt. And then once they got cornered between uh, the Egyptian army and the Red Sea, God opened up the Red Sea. They were able to go through on dry ground and uh, God just basically rescued those people. It was just a, a really amazing thing. Well, then two years later, they had come to the land that God had promised to them. And uh, they sent spies into the land. God had told them, I'm going to go ahead of you. I've got this land all prepared. I want you to go on into the land. And uh, the people sent their spies in and the spies came back and said, oh, there's people living in that land and they're huge. And there's just no way in the world that we're going to be able to take possession of that land. And so they refused to go. Even though two years earlier they had seen these amazing miracles, they refused to go because they were afraid of the people that were between them and the land that God had promised to them. And so they didn't inherit the land. They weren't able to take possession of it. And basically, I think it boils down, they feared the people more than they feared God. So, in the beginning there, 4 verse 1, uh, the author says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear any of you seem to have come short of it. Therefore, since a promise remains. He's making a mention here. I don't believe that the Israelites had the chance, a second chance. But in this passage, he says there's a, there's a chance. And he's addressing the people who were a couple of years after the time of Jesus. When I say a couple of years, it might have been 20, 30, 50 years. I don't know. But it was you know, right around that same 100-year period that, that Jesus was alive. And that there was still a chance. There was a chance for them to be able to enter the rest of God. Maybe not a physical place that God had prepared for them, but uh, the rest that we think of as heaven is a possibility for us. And so uh, he says, therefore, since a, a, a promise remains of entering his rest. And then he goes on and he says, let us, uh, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. And uh, I think a lot of people in our world have problems with that word fear. We can think of fear in a lot of different ways. One of the ways that we think of fear is, is just being terrified of something and we're running away from it. Say, for example, you wake up in the night and your house is on fire, there's flames all around you. You're going to get out of that house as quick as you can because of fear. You can't control the fire once it gets to a certain point. You know, you might be able to control it when it's just a small little fire, but eventually it comes to the point where you can't control it yourself. And so you run away. That's one kind of fear. Another kind of fear is, is uh, uh, I liken this one to like a, a person who's training wild animals. They're going to have fear of that animal that they're training. Uh, maybe when they're performing, they don't exhibit that fear, but it's still there. It's a part of who they are. Uh, they recognize that this animal is powerful and it's something that, that could do damage and do harm to them. And, you know, then there are the irrational fears, fears of, of public speaking uh, and things along those lines. And, you know, as we look at, at the fear of God in this particular section, one of the things that we need to consider, or maybe part of what we can consider, is that maybe God's a little bit of each one of these sort of fears. Uh, and I think probably the one that I identify with most as the fear of God would be the animal trainer. Not saying that I'm able to control God, but just a recognition that, this, that, that, that God is so much more powerful than me. And that power is under control. It, it, it's, it's for my good. There's benefit to this power. I mean, there's so much amazingness that goes on. And so I respect that. And some people may say that I fear that, that power that God possess you, possesses. Um, but that's the kind of fear I think that he's talking about when he talks about the fear of the Lord and when we look at it in other places. It's not that we're afraid that we have to run for our lives 
like a, there's a fire that's chasing us or there's something that's Im imminently going to bad that's going to happen to us, but just a, a healthy respect of the authority and the majesty and the power of God. And so we have that fear and that fear causes us to, to respect. But you know, if we have that knowledge of a God who is that great and powerful, but our actions don't reflect that, then do we really fear God that, that much? And I think it's important for us to know where our salvation is. When we say fear the Lord, I'm talking, we're talking about make sure that you know where your salvation is. I don't have to run around all of my life saying, oh dear, I'm, I'm afraid that I've, I've just stepped out of God's uh, good favor or something like that. I firmly believe that uh, my life is secure in God. But we need to live within the guardrails that God has established for us. And that's the fear part. Imagine if, if we are traveling down a road and there's guardrails on both sides. Those guardrails are put up to protect us from dangers that might be on the left or the right. Sorry, I got those wrong. The left or the right. But uh, we live within those guardrails. We have room to maneuver. We have room to go back and forth. But uh, those guardrails are there to protect us to keep us from going to the places where we're not supposed to go. So our first action is we need to have a fear of the Lord, a healthy fear of the Lord. And maybe a better word is respect, but have that fear of the Lord. The second action is that we need to have faith. We need to have faith. And as the author goes on, he, he kind of compares the Christians and the Jews. Continue, he's continuing on uh, with that narrative of where the Israelites refused to go into the promised land. And uh, he's kind of pointing out, here's where they went wrong. And so he gives us some information, but I think he's letting us know, you know, you people, the people that are, are reading the book of Hebrews today, the people that are listening to this message, the people that were alive in Jesus' day and heard him, uh, the people that were receiving this message uh, that we found, find in the book of Hebrews originally. All of those people have a privilege, and that privilege is they know who God is, and they know what he's done for them, and they know the blessings. They have all of the same information that the Jewish people had at the time of, of this writing, or at the time of Moses, I should say. Uh, they all have that same privilege, but they, they don't all act on it in the same way. So the last part of, of verse 2, um, in the middle of that verse is the, the conjunction, but, and the author says, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. They knew, those people knew. Moses had given them the message. He told them, God wants you to enter the land. That's how they knew that this was what they were supposed to, to do. God had given them a messenger, Moses, and when God spoke to Moses, and he spoke to him directly, Moses delivered that message to the people. And so they, they knew what the message was, but they failed to, to act. Instead, they looked at the physical barriers that were between them and the promise that God had for them, and they cho chose to be afraid of those barriers rather than have uh, faith in what God would do. There was no profit in their faith. There was no profit in what they knew because of their lack of faith, I should say. And he said, it did not profit them being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Uh, if we have hear things, but we don't have the faith connected with it, then it's not going to have any benefit to us at either. In verse 3, he says, For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. You know, as I look at that verse where he's quoting Psalm 95 in the middle of verse 3, So I swore in my wrath, this is the voice of God, they shall not enter my rest. That just sounds very, very ominous to me. And it sounds as if God is saying, they're not going to inherit the promised land, but there's a lot of other great promises that they're not going to receive. And I believe that part of what he is talking about 
is eternity. Heaven, being able to spend eternity in the presence of God, was something that they missed out on because of their lack of faith. They needed to listen to the word of God and they needed to obey the word of God. These people were privileged, but they failed to receive the message that God had for them. A lot of times I believe that, that uh, when we look at, we fail to see this in our own lives, but uh, the people that this author is talking about were Jewish people. And the Jewish religious leaders were uh, strongly inclined to say that because a person was a Jew, they were privileged, that they had a special place in God's arena, in God's congregation, however you want to say it. But these Jewish people, their Jewishness, if I can use that, their connection, their fam familial connection didn't do anything for them because they needed to have faith combined with that. And they failed to have that faith. And so how does that look for us today? I think a lot of us do the same thing today. We look at it and we say, well, I've gone to church. Someone asks us about our, our, our faith. We say, well, I've gone to church all of my life. Wait a minute. What does that have to do with your faith? Just because you've gone to church all of your life doesn't mean that you have faith. Maybe we think that because we come from a Christian family, that also doesn't say anything about our faith. Or maybe because we live in a Christian nation, that doesn't say anything about our faith. And in these passages, the author is emphasizing that we need to, to have our own personal faith in Jesus Christ. That's what's important. That's what's vital for us. Not uh, riding on the coattails of our nationality, not riding on the coattails of our family, not riding on the coattails of our church, but having a faith in Jesus Christ is what really needs to happen. And so uh, we live in a world where we have a great deal of information. We have all kinds of knowledge. I mean, you look around our houses, we've got Bibles everywhere. I can't tell you how many copies of the Bible that I have. And I have multiple translations on my phone, on my tablet, and on my computer. Uh, we, we could not, we can't even look, uh, begin to imagine how many how many ways that we have scripture available to us. But we need more than just that knowledge. We need faith in Jesus Christ and faith believing that Jesus Christ is the way for our salvation. It doesn't come through my personal efforts. It comes as a result of believing in Jesus Christ and that he is the source of my salvation. So the first action is that we need to fear the Lord. The second action is that we need to have faith and then the third action is that we need to live in obedience. So as we look at that, uh, that idea of living, uh, living in obedience, I want us to understand that our salvation, having faith in Jesus Christ and the salvation that he offers to us, it comes before living in obedience. A lot of people believe that because of their obedience, they're going to make it to God. It's not going to happen. I mean, that's a good foundation for us. It might be a good practice for us to get into. But what really counts is that we believe in Jesus Christ and then we live in obedience. Uh, in several places throughout here, uh, these passages, chapter 3 and chapter 4, he quotes from Psalm 95 where God says, They shall not enter my rest. And the reason that they didn't enter his rest is because of their disobedience. Obviously, one of the, the, the uh, author's favorite passages was Psalm 95. He says in, in verse 7, he quotes again from Psalm 95, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden, uh, do not harden your hearts. We need to be careful that we're not allowing our hearts to become hard. And as he talks about living in obedience, I'm looking at specifically at verse 6. Uh, the last part of that, those whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. And then also in chapter, or in verse 11, I should say, let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. 
It's important for us to be obedient to God. And uh, it seems like that obedience uh, builds a wall between us and God, and it makes it harder for us to get to God. So the Jewish people, I think as, as God was talking about them entering his rest, there were several things that he was pointing to. If they would have obeyed, they could have gone into the, the uh, promised land 40 years earlier. And I believe that those would have been 40 years that would have been, would have been marked with rest. But they didn't get that because of their disobedience. But I think he also cut off from them eternity. They didn't experience heaven because of their disobedience. And so with our, with our obedience, we see rest. We see peace. We see comfort that comes to us as we live in, in obedience. And once again, I look at that, that uh, first part of uh, Psalm 95, 11. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter in my rest. I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That's really something I don't want to hear God say about me. And the obedience was to the word of Moses. But who was Moses? He was God's representative. Moses would go and he would speak with God. God would deliver a message to Moses. And Moses would go and he would deliver that message to the people. That was how those people received the word of God. Today, it's different for us. We have a Bible that God uses to speak to us. And so when we're reading our Bible and when we're studying our Bible, we need to pay extra attention to what he has to say to us from his word. We also need to be involved in prayer. And in our prayer, we need to be listening to God. But I think the primary way in which God speaks to us, maybe 90, 95% of, of the way in which God speaks to us is through his word. And so it's so important for us to be involved in listening to the Word of God. We have the Bible today. And even at the time when this was written, people didn't have great access to the Bible. They could go to the, the synagogue or maybe a wealthy person's house where they would have had scriptures that were available to them. But today, like I said, so many, we have Bibles. We have lots and lots of Bibles and Bibles are everywhere. Um, and so it's important for us to be listening to what God has to say to us. And not just listening, but be obedient to what God has to say uh, to us. There was a danger for these people who didn't listen to what God had said. There was a, a, a physical consequence that they didn't get to go into the promised land. But I believe that there was also that spiritual consequence that they were in danger of the fires of hell because of their disobedience. You know, we live in a world and we have Christians all around who, who believe that they can go on and sin and they can ask God to forgive them of their sin. That disobedience is dangerous, dangerous for us. And I believe that that's why, why uh, the author says here, warns us so heavily against dis disobedience that we need to obey what God has to say for us. And you know, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking there's something that God does for us. When we become a Christian, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God in the Spirit comes and He lives within us. He becomes a part of us and who we are. And as we look at that, we may not realize that He's there, but sometimes as we make decisions, we feel uh, maybe a little bit of uh, some of our conscience feeling sensitive to what we're doing. Maybe we hear a little voice saying, you shouldn't do that. And I believe that that's God's Holy Spirit talking to us. He's giving us that message. And you know, when he gives us that message, we have a choice to make. We can either ignore that voice, or we can do what that voice says. If we ignore that voice, I believe that that voice is become, going to become quieter and quieter and quieter and quieter, eventually to the point where we don't hear it anymore. And so we need to make sure that we don't stop listening to the voice of God. That we don't stop listening to the Holy Spirit in our life, but that we're attentive to what the Holy Spirit has to say. And as we read scripture and things pop out to us, that's the Holy Spirit working on us, telling us, hey, you know, these are things that you need to be paying attention to. But as we become sensitive 
as we listen to that, then I believe that we become more and more and more sensitive. So it just all depends on which direction we choose to go. If we choose to listen to the Holy Spirit, we become more sensitive. If we choose to ignore the Holy Spirit, we become more and more numb to what he has to say. And all of these can lead to, if not eternal separation from God, it's definitely going to have hurt our relationship here on earth. It hurt those people who were in Israel all of those years ago. They missed out on some great blessings because of their failure to obey what God had told them to do. And the same is going to be true for us today. If we do what God tells us to do, there are going to be blessings that, connect, that are connected with that. But if we fail to do that, there are going to be consequences. Physical, spiritual consequences. And maybe even eternal consequences. So we need to be careful. As I close out today, I just take you back again to that image of guardrails. And if we think of these, these three actions, fearing the Lord, having faith in Jesus Christ, and then living in obedience and, and learning to hear that voice of the Holy Spirit. I just imagine those things as being guardrails that are along our path. And God's not so strict with us. He's going to give us a set of railroad tracks and say, you need to stay on these tracks. But he gives us guardrails. And he says, you can wander back and forth within these guardrails. Just don't go outside of the guardrails. And as we live within those guardrails, God is with us. We may remain with God. And uh, we're taken care of. Most of all, we're not jeopardizing our eternity with Jesus Christ. So we want to be careful with how we live and make sure that we do the things that bring glory and honor to God. You want to have rest? Make sure that these three actions are a part of your life. Fear the Lord, have faith in the Lord, and live in obedience to the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this message from the book of Hebrews. We thank you for the author and for his inspiration. And we would just ask, Lord, that you would help us to live lives that are pleasing to you. And I pray now, Lord, that you would bless each person who's listening to these words and guide them throughout this week. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for joining me today, and I hope you have a great week.